The Merrimack River formed the northern boundary of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and the Puritans hoped this would lead them to the Lake of the Iroquois or to the South Sea. They had great ambition for this waterway. But unfortunately, the Merrimack is not navigable. Lots of rapids, it narrows, so it really just formed a boundary until the early 19th century, when the new generation of 1815, 1820 realizes that the Merrimack River generates more water power than any other waterway in North America. Here in what then was the village of Chelmsford, it falls 35 feet just in the course of a mile or two. So in 1815 and 1816, Boston investors look here, they buy up the land in North Chelmsford to divert the water into canals to generate power to turn mill wheels. And they name it the city of Lowell. So the Merrimack River, which had not benefited the Puritans, is going to become the industrial hub of North America. So by the 18-teens and 1820s, a revolution is taking place here in New England, the Industrial Revolution. Francis Cabot Lowell had gone to England in 1811, seen the industrial machinery that powered England's industrial transformation, and came back here remembering enough that he was able, with his associates, to recreate mills here, in fact, create bigger mills. In 1820, the city of Lowell is built here on the banks of the Merrimack, named for Francis Cabot Lowell. And the city of Lowell becomes, by the 1830s, the largest industrial city in the United States. And the Merrimack River Valley is the most industrialized place in the Western Hemisphere, producing textiles that are sold throughout the world. It's an industrial transformation Boston remains the hub of this industrial enterprise that transforms New England. Just about every New England household had a spinning wheel where the women would take wool or flax and turn that into thread, spending long winter evenings making thread. Not everyone had a loom. One woman might have a loom and she then would take this thread from her neighbors or the yarn from her neighbors and turn it into cloth. Now on a hand loom, a really skilled weaver could perhaps make an inch or so of cloth in three or four hours if she was good. So it's a long laborious process of taking wool or flax and turning it into a finished textile. But then we have a revolution in New England in the 19th century with the building of industries, factories like this one, where the raw textile, the raw cotton or flax could be brought in and turned into a finished cloth. The other revolution, of course, is the development of cotton. By 1820, the United States is the world's leading producer of cotton, surpassing India. Henry Adams said that after 1815, Americans were more concerned with the price of cotton, less with the rights of man. So you have a parallel here. Cotton is being produced in the southern states by slave labor. Here in New England, cotton is being turned into finished textiles by the labor of free women who come to a place like Lowell, where they'll spend a few years working in a factory like this one, earning wages, money that they can then save, they can put aside as a dowry. And then after a few years, they might go home, back to the farm, now perhaps they can buy a farm or help their families, or they can use their dowry to find a husband, or they might stay in the city running a boarding house using the money they have earned in the mill to build a different life afterwards. New England in the 19th century was the only part of the country where women outnumbered the men. It was a small differential, but still a significant one. And it's also significant here that free women are part of the manufacturing economy, in fact, a central part of the manufacturing economy, as young women will leave the farm, come to the city to find work. The young women who came into Lowell to work in the mills would live in boarding houses like this one with other young women. 
and after working hours. They went to lectures, they had musical events, they published their own journal, The Lowell Offering, with their own original poetry, prose, short stories. They had an intellectual life here that would not have been available to them in the rural hinterlands of New England. In the 1840s, Charles Dickens, the English novelist, who had exposed the horrors of the British manufacturing system, visited the United States and he came to Lowell. He most wanted to see this American industrial city and he contrasted the way the working women lived in Lowell with the degradation of the British industrial workers. He saw this as a real difference between American society and English society as these young women weren't being ground down by the turmoil of industrialization, but instead were using it for their own benefit.